I think if there's any lesson to be drawn is that uh, Africa need to take responsibility for their own security. They should stop relying on the UN. The UN is too big, too slow to handle uh, crisis. When Africans are involved as communities, not as one country to the other, um, we have a result like what we saw with um, the Force Brigade. But you need to have it timed. You cannot have open-ended missions, which is what we tend to have with the UN. So, so far, the Force Intervention Brigade has done a good job in creating a buffer between civilians and rebels and so on, especially in the case of Goma. We've also seen them intervene in other parts around North Kivu. But that can only be sustained if the political will is there and the political will is as sustainable as the mission itself. But also, nobody will, no country will invest forever. So country need to know that they're sending the troops for one specific purpose. But beyond that, um, the responsibility of security of Congolese is primarily to uh, the Congolese government. So I think it, is, it behooves African country to start putting pressure on the Congolese government so it can work to protect its own people. Congolese are capable of protecting themselves. They should not be beggar for their security. That should be the last thing. It's a big country. It's the uh, fourth largest uh, as far as population goes in the continent. So why should it be uh, depending on others for its protection? Well, I think, I think the African Union is very weak. And the African Union is not, in my view, is not the right organization to handle these kind of operations. I think operations like this should be handled maybe at the local, at the regional level. So the SADC of the world, the EAC of the world. And also the other element that is missing is institutional transparency. Right? It's very hard to have operations of this nature when you're dealing with countries that are not democratic in nature. There is no, there is no responsibility. This is not, should, should not be a business decided by a handful of heads of states. These are issues that should be debated in parliament, with, in various countries. So I see regional forces being more... If you look at this, the, the history of um, the Force Intervention Brigade, it didn't come to the AU. It came up through SADC because the DRC is a member of SADC and SADC was interested in helping. So it's very important, but SADC is limited because SADC is a mismatch of dictators, half dictators, um, Democrats. So you wonder how do they really come to a consensus in terms, the operations are there for the benefit of the people. If you're gonna help the people, the people have to have a say. And the say of the people or the peoples in plural come to their parliament. If parliament are dysfunctional in many of these countries, what kind of result we have? So to me, those are serious policy implications. If President Museveni will send Amisom to Somalia, I don't know how it works in the Ugandan parliament. Are the mechanism that's for people of Uganda to say, what are we doing in Somalia? Why are we there? Did they sign on? After all, it's their daughters and sons that are dying. But whose interest is it? The debate is not fully. Uh, you also ask the question, is this the only way to approach Somalia? Are there other venues that uh, the region or the AU is not really exploited? But that discussion is not had if you're not talking to your parliament and the people in the various countries. The protection of civilians, like what I was saying early, is the only security reason that we should have, whether it's internally in the country or outside as we deal with international organization. So how do you protect civilians? Well, you have to have laws, you have to, have, you have to be willing to prosecute people who do not protect them. You have to have government that are willing to stake their own political will. So in other words, if a country X does not have human rights respect in their own country, why do you expect them that when they will show up in country Y, all of us and they will embrace these lofty goals, these lofty principles that they do abide at home, that's one. But then two, Protecting civilians means often dying. You're willing to fight, meaning the contributing countries are comfortable enough to see body bags come home. So it's not an expedient maneuver where you send your troop over there. It's good for your PR. People say, look, country X is contributing. No, but when it hits, are you willing to let your troops? So I'll give you an example. Um, when I was embedded for UN troops, 
it was very clear that they, they took only calculated risks. In part because there was no motivation to go die for another country. It just doesn't make sense. Why would you die for another country um, to protect somebody else who's not your own? It's a very complicated proposition, right? So in order for it to work, the, the, um, the objective should be very clear. As I said, the mandate should be very clear. The timeline should be clear. If the, F, F, uh, the Foreign Intervention Brigade was going to go and we're going to fight the M23, we'll fight M23 for X amount of time and we'll do X, Y. But we cannot, meaning FIB cannot continue serving as a buffer zone indefinitely. Um, that's really a key. If the local are not willing to die to protect their own civilians, why will a foreigner feel compelled to do that? It's, it's, it's not natural as a, as a proposition, unless that foreigner is gaining something that is very important to them. I don't know, minerals or money or something, but that doesn't work. And I think that's why often, uh, that's why often bilateral agreement work better, or regional agreement, which is the case with FIB, it's through SADC, so it's not the entire world that is debating this. When Malawi sent his troops there, Malawi knows what they're getting to, yeah? or Tanzania. And in fact, Tanzania is sending people to FIB, not just because of Congo, but because of local, regional, strategic interests that Tanzania is interested in. So it's beyond Congo if they're doing this thing. I, I, I believe personally that the entire AU model needs to be redone. It's a tall order, but you should not be a member of the AU just simply because you're an African country. Right. You know, that's how it works everywhere. You're not a member of the EU just because you're in Europe. Right. Turkey is in Europe, is not a member of the EU. Right. So we need to have conditions that make sure that if you're going to be a member of the AU, you have to apply. And here are the conditions we set. Why I'm saying that? Because you have to uphold certain principles in your own country. Right? Democracy, human rights, transparency, good governance, and so on. Once you do that, and then you join the AU, you will be then able to uphold the chart of the, the AU. And when situations like military intervention arise, you will be able to uphold those principles because you uphold them at home anyway. It's not new. And if you're good with governance and transparency at home, most likely you pay your dues. But if you don't have that model, then the AU become a rubber stamp for various projects that do not benefit the people of Africa. In many ways, I will argue one of the big impediments to the advancement of Africa today is the AU. Because it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's an organization that sits there, that looks good on paper, but doesn't do the work. So uh, before we get to war, that means governance is, is collapse. That's why people get to war. That means somebody has been dominating somebody for so long, or somebody is not respecting other people's rights. That's typically why people get to war. That means the AU saw that happen and let it fester, right? You cannot have an organization that says we're not go we, we, we don't support coup d'etat. But then they don't denounce dictators. They, they denounce people who pervert constitutions. So you cannot have it both ways. You have to decide. And until we get that in order, then a lot of these other missions that you're referring to, uh, joint operation, military or economic, will start making sense. We can talk about free trade. So how do you have free trade with countries that are not free? Right? So if you don't have, if your own management in your country is not transparent in your economy, so how are you going to have a transparent commerce with the other people? How can you have joint economic project when it's, there's no transparency? It doesn't work. It's not going to work in the long run. Somebody will try to dominate the other. So those are, those are, I think to me, we need to turn the entire model of the AU upside down and start challenging it. In many ways, I feel like the Organization of African Unity work much better than, uh, than the AU. Uh, people had principles. There were few democracies then, but people had principles. And they stuck to those principles and they pushed. They pushed. The examples, you can look at the case of uh, Western Sahara. You know, Morocco, Morocco had a lot of issue with Western Sahara. That issue divided the AU. Eventually, Morocco left the, I mean, the Organization of African Unity because people stood by principles. Whether they're right or wrong, but those principles are important. We don't see principles today. <laughs>